Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the parallel session on rethinking the state for the 21st century. I'm delighted to be here with four very distinguished panelists today. Maurizio Bussolo, lead economist at the Office of the Chief Economist for Europe and Central Asia regions at the World Bank. Jacob Acker, director of the Institutions for Social and Policy Study and Stanley Brazil, Professor of Political Science at Yale University. David Steven, Associate Director at the Center for International Cooperation, New York University. And Chu Chang Chu, Head of the United Nations Project Office on Governance in the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. My name is Romina Borini. I am Senior Advisor to the OECD Secretary General, and I'm the coordinator of the OECD Inclusive Growth Initiative. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to give you some context to this session and what are the main objectives and what are sort of the outcomes that we would like to achieve through this discussion. So um, for those of you who attended this morning's seminar on rethinking the society, uh, you know that uh, in the session this morning, we focus very much on the same trends that we're going to discuss today, the rise in inequality, the loss of trust in institutions, and the new challenges posed by the digital transformation and other mega trends. And so today, again, in this session, we're going to talk about these same forces and how these forces are actually contributing to disrupt and at the same time reshape society and the state and the, I think the objective here is really try to understand how both society and the state need to adapt in a way that is complementary. This morning we discussed mainly the constraints that hinder the action of national governments in a globalized work, but I think this session specifically is going to put the state back into the picture by discussion, discussing the different ways in which it can adapt to global maker trends and how we have to reinvent the role of state, its mission, and the means of actions in the 21st century. Before I go to the speakers, let me also uh, highlight the reason why the Inclusive Growth Initiative worked uh, on organizing this session. We launched in June our policy framework for action on inclusive growth. This is a policy guidance that we put together to help uh, governments to work on the inclusive growth agenda. And in particular, in this framework, we are recommending governments to investment, to put investment and investing in people and places left behind, to uh, support business dynamism and to make uh, labor markets working in a more inclusive manner, but also uh, to uh, put in place a governance system that is more responsive to the citizens' needs and more efficient. So as we were actually working and developing this, and especially now that we want to pilot the framework and apply the framework at the national sort of levels, we are starting to ask ourselves the question, how are we thinking about the sort of the political dimensions of this agenda? So the recommendations that we put together are very much, I would say, uh, solutions thought by some technocrats. But in the real world, uh, those solutions obviously need to go through this very, very strong sort of reality check which is about you know, to what extent these solutions are actually policy, po politically acceptable and legitimate in the views of citizens. So I think this is uh, really sort of the drive behind the session this morning. And I think really what we would like to discuss is to what extent uh, norms and perceptions are actually there to support or not policies for pre-distribution or redistribution. So what sorts of norms and beliefs and perceptions are underpinning the social contracts? And I uh, really want to emphasize the S. This is not a singular word, it's social contracts. We know that the social contracts, the notion, and the reality of social contracts differ widely across countries, not just within the OECD area, but you know, more largely across all regions of the world but also how the norms and those perceptions are actually changing and how they are being shaped by the transformations that societies and economies are undergoing. 
So these are the main topics for discussion and the way, I mean, the, the, the way we're going to work on this and the form of this session is that we're going to start with a series of presentations by our speakers and then we're going to open it for discussion with you all and of course we very much hope that you're going to be sort of responsive and interactive and we really make this uh, sort of a true conversation. So let me start by inviting Maurizio uh, to come here and give his presentation. And please, Maurizio, provide us with an overview of what the World Bank is doing on these topics. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Romina. Uh, so the presentation appears. Uh, OK, very good. <coughs> All right. So. Um, well, I just noticed that in the in the panel we are two Italians and talking about rethinking the state uh, when our fellow citizenship have, uh, have voted for a fairly populist government. Uh, I don't know how much uh, credibility we have, but uh, let, let, let's 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 keep going and and uh, hopefully you will be convinced. Uh, okay, so my um, uh, my starting point uh, is. Uh, is a measurement point, as uh, as we all uh, heard uh, from uh, from yesterday uh, uh, plenary about uh, the follow up uh, uh, Sen Stiglitz and Fitusi report. Uh, uh, beyond GDP, basically measuring GDP is not enough, and so my starting point is also that we have to look at uh, uh, more than GDP, and in this report. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, outcome that we look at is, uh, is inequality. And this is a problem, uh, one of the most fundamental problems of our times. And so I don't need to, to convince you a lot uh, uh, about that. Uh, we, in the, in the report that backs uh, the, the, this presentation, um, we, we don't necessarily look at all the causes of, of the uh, rise of, of inequality. Uh, we refer to it uh, as uh, technological change, uh, globalization, uh, aging of populations, and, and even policies are, are potentially uh, behind that. But uh, rather than, than that, what uh, we do in this report is, is mainly two things. One is, uh, is uh, that to, to, to fix this problem, uh, we need to understand better uh, the positive part of the of, of the work. We need to understand better uh, how these distributional tensions uh, come about and are evolving. And uh, then the positive from the positive part, we, we move to policy advice, and we have one way we we'll look at this is what uh, uh, what we need to do and how we need to rethink the uh, the social contract uh, uh, for 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 solving this problem so i emphasize two things in 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 this introduction the uh, i'm not talking exactly about inequality but distribution attention the other uh, key uh, word that I use is social contract. Let, let me let me explain a little bit uh, both of uh, both of them. So why do I use distribution tensions instead of um, of inequality? But for for three main reasons. The first reason is that um, it's it's a bit technical, but it's 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 still important. The first reason is that when people think about inequality and even economies, we mostly most of the time think about vertical inequality, which is inequality across all people uh, as individuals. So we measure an outcome, uh, income, uh, education, health, and we look at the difference, the disparities across individuals. But what is important is to look also at disparities across groups, so horizontal inequality. Um, uh, um, uh, Francis Stewart, uh, Oxford uh, um, professor, in 2001, had this uh, very interesting uh, lecture that she gave at, at Wider where she uh, basically um, reintroduced, uh, uh, refocused our attention towards these horizontal uh, distributional uh, tensions, horizontal inequality. And uh, the spin that she gave is that uh, differences uh, among groups uh, affect uh, Affect are not are not just focused on uh, different economic difference, but behind beyond the group uh, there is identity. So the 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 importance 
of looking at disparities across groups is that it affects identity of, of, of groups. And identities are really important because they affect the way people behave and affect their, their well-being. There's, there's some research in, uh, in economics about that, and I, you have some, some citation there, and also a recent uh, book of uh, Fukuyama on this is, uh, is, is quite interesting, more from a political science uh, point of view. So first thing is that horizontal inequality allows us to look beyond a difference just in economic terms, but also a difference that is about uh, determination of identities uh, and, and so on. The second reason why we look at, uh, we, look at uh, uh, or, um, we talk about distributional tension is that there is a, a gap, uh, a visible gap between how people think uh, inequality is evolving and how we economists measure uh, inequality. So in, uh, in the region that I focus mostly, Europe and Central Asia, inequality has been decreasing mostly, uh, uh, but people, when asked, they still reply that inequality is actually increasing. And uh, the way to understand that is that uh, the inequality that we measure objectively is vertical inequality, but people think about other things, think about identity, think about fairness. So you can, have, you can have the same inequality, but more of it is explained by an unfair process, and so people be, feel that is, is, is inequality has gone up. Finally, <clears throat> while in the, from a policy perspective, while the uh, Europe and Central Asia is a region where uh, policies are still very effective in reducing vertical inequality. They may not be so effective in reducing horizontal inequality. So that's another reason why we use this terminology, distribution attention. So uh, the second uh, term that I use is social contract. Uh, let me define it a, a, a little uh, uh, better uh, here. So the, the, the way we think of, of it is, is not really the philosophical, uh, uh, political science uh, 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 way, but is more uh, derived from uh, an economic uh, uh, perspective. And we think of it as an equilibrium between these uh, dynamic equilibrium, an equilibrium that evolves all the time, between these three elements. Element number one is that uh, there is a generation of uh, distribution that is generated by, by for market forces. The, think of the, of the difference of wages between skill and unskill, that it, it's, it's, it's coming out from supply and demand of, of, of these type of, of workers. Then there is a second element, which is a redistribution of, of these resources or, or, a, or a regulation of the market that determines the, the, the distribution of these, of these resources. And then the third element is this, uh, the uh, individual preference for equity redistribution. So if you wish, the equilibrium is between one and two that are the supply of equity, and three, which is the demand side. If these, these three evolve continuously, and if they are within a certain uh, gap, things can adjust, but if there is a, a persistent uh, uh, gap in the equilibrium, then things can, can unravel and the social contract can, can, uh, um, can break down. So that's, um, that's the way we think of, of the social contract, as I said, uh, is uh, coming from the economic tradition, uh, and there again you have, uh, you have some reference that have, have, uh, of people that have thought about, uh, about that. So the, in, in graphical terms, the whole, uh, the whole uh, report uh, is organized around, around this uh, uh, balance between the market that generates a certain distribution the public policy that changed that and the uh, and the preference and the 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 report goes into uh, looking at all of these pieces uh, in detail i don't have time now to to do that but uh, uh, if you if you look at the report you 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 will see that there are basically three parts that look at those those three things the one uh, let me give you a couple of examples and then i i i i i, I stop uh, there so the the first example i want to give you is about market generated uh, distributional uh, tension and uh, we look at three groups uh, for horizontal inequality generations uh, or birth courts uh, workers and, and, and regions. Let me give you an example of, of uh, an inequality that is not up immediately apparent, but it's, it's, it's out there and affects uh, people's lives. The, okay, so this graph is <coughs> a graph that shows you uh, 
the um, difference in within cohort inequality for different uh, groups of people in three different countries. So on the vertical act axis, you have how much inequality there is of a group uh, of individuals that are born around the same time. And on the horizontal axis is these groups, okay? And there are three, three countries. So imagine the, the cohort of my uh, father, my cohort, and the cohort of my, of my daughters. And you see these, uh, uh, the differences of, of what, is, what, what these cohort experience when they were about 35 years of age. So uh, let's, begin, let's look at uh, Italy. So my, my, my father was born a little later than that, but that's uh, when he was 35, when he had entered the labor market, he was experiencing among his peers an inequality similar to Japan, uh, 0.319. The inequality that uh, uh, millennials are uh, experiencing is, is of a different world, of a different country, actually, is an inequality of Chile. So that's the, the amount of difference that, that, that people experience, even though these cohorts are coexist and the overall inequality may be different, but the peers, the inequality that they care about is very different. So uh, I don't have time to talk. So that was just one example of, 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 of inequality. I don't have time to talk about public policy, but what we show in the report is that, and we have heard this in, uh, before, that um, <clears throat> public policies were designed in an era that uh, was different and that they don't necessarily take care of these, of these inequalities. That's the problem that, 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 that we have. And, uh, and uh, for perceptions, uh, I have one, one example that I want to show you here again. So um, uh, this, this again is a graph that uh, is basically, there is a paper, whole paper behind this, but it, it, there's a LITS, the uh, Life in Transition Survey, where people are asked uh, where they place themselves in a country ladder of 10 steps. So they are asked, uh, whether you are today, you feel you belong to the ladder one, which is the poorest decile, or ladder uh, 10, which is the rich, richest decile. And the curve here shows you the probability of placing yourself in one of these uh, uh, steps. Uh, oh, no, sorry, the probability of placing yourself in ladder one or two, so feeling poor. So, and the uh, horizontal axis show you where you actually are in your decile. So as you can see, the richest you are, the least likely is that you place yourself poor. And so you see the, the, the downward pen, um, sloping curve. But uh, <clears throat> what is interesting is, is to show uh, what happens when we compare uh, this first curve with a second curve, which is drawn for the individuals who are at the same uh, level of actual incomes, but they are generating their incomes from not uh, being employed full time. So for every, uh, so that, that's the difference. If you look at the, the two individuals, they both are on the side six, but uh, the ones that receive their income from not continuous uh, employment, they feel much poorer. And that, how much poorer they feel is as if they were in the side actual decile three. So this gives you an, a, a comparison of insecurity. We monetize insecurity. Insecurity of not having a full employment is equivalent to three decile of actual income. So clearly a, a, a reform that pays people, pays just uh, unemployment, won't, won't, uh, won't solve this very easily unless you paid um, a lot. Uh, but people appreciate uh, security. So the, uh, I conclude uh, uh, now. So w w the report shows three parts. It shows this market-generated inequality. So how does the policy deal with that and produce a supply? And then there is the, the demand side. If there is an imbalance, there is a, a, a potential uh, uh, cracks in the social contract. Uh, what do we do? What are we? proposing to fix uh, this is basically three principles. One is that we should, uh, we should uh, 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 extend the protection to all individuals uh, uh, independently of the type of contract that they have, while at the same time, therefore, not uh, 
blocking flexibility in the labor market, but there shouldn't be difference in terms of eligibility for programs, depending if you are on a temporary contract or on a part-time contract or whatever. So that's principle one, uh, uh, move towards universalism. Again, seeking universalism in the provision of, of public goods, uh, social assistance, social insurance and basically uh, basic quality uh, service. So we are almost there on, on health uh, and education, but we're not there in terms of security against, against uh, economic, other economic risks. And the last one is uh, supporting uh, progressivity on the, on the tax base. So you have to have a, a fair system. You can't just have it on the expenditure side. You have also to have it on the revenue side. And, and, and this has to be extended to uh, taxation of capital. So uh, I stop there. Uh, you have the full report here on, the, on, the, on, the, on that link. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maurizio. Before I give the floor to Jacob, just a couple of quick follow-ups from my side. Uh, I think the framework that you uh, developed about uh, defining social contract is a very interesting one. Uh, one sort of thought is um, when you were describing the, the, the supply of, um, uh, of the supply side of that social contract, um, you know, why did you, you know, so it is obvious that you need to talk of, uh, of that supply side in terms of redistribution, but in a way, uh, the other bit of it, which is sort of the outcomes uh, that come from sort of the overseas market forces are also shaped by policies. So, I mean, the, what you see in terms of labor outcomes today and, you know, wages inequality, but also, you know, uh, inequalities in employment and or in unemployment, they are also obviously shaped to some extent by, by policies. So I, I was wondering whether you know, in that notion of supply side, there is a little bit of scope for introducing some of the, again, policy settings that have a, a strong sort of input on the sort of pre-distribution. Uh, I'm talking of pre-distribution because this is actually a very interesting concept that was developed by Jacob uh, next to you a few years be uh, ago. Uh, the other uh, thought and question really for you is, uh, I thought would you ex explain to us in terms of how you monetize economic insecurity and looking at the differences in terms of um, sort of perceptions uh, around um, around um, sort of income inequality and whether where people uh, feel they belong to is interesting. I was wondering whether you also look at what what, does, what is the let's say the implication uh, from that uh, in terms of demand for redistribution. In other words, if you look at the correlation between perceptions of inequality and uh, support for more redistributive policies, for instance, or even, uh, you know, support for paying uh, taxes and that sort of things. Thank you. So shall I respond? I respond now? Yes, okay. All right. Uh, uh, okay, so the... Um, uh, well, it's, it's a bit of a simplification. I agree that the supply side and, and, and demand side of things are, are a little bit more complex. Uh, now, the, the, what is... What the framework tries to do is tries to figure out whether the, uh, the, the, the policies that we have, especially you have to, you have to think that we were writing a, a report for uh, an area, focus on an area of the world which has the most developed uh, welfare state. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, discuss, um, discuss uh, inefficiencies or ineffective policy in an environment uh, where uh, on average uh, an OEC, um, a European OECD country reduces uh, the Gini by 21 points uh, from the um, disposal from the market income to the disposal income so it's amazingly efficient and and and, and strong the redistribution that happens uh, in uh, in in Europe however <clears throat> however uh, when uh, when you look at the post uh, redistribution and and post distribution uh, uh, from an horizontal perspective you you begin to see that it's not it's not that efficient so certain certain individuals certain occupations certain generations are not uh, so covered by 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 the current system and um, and that that creates uh, problems in terms of pre distribution the it's it's um, it's we look at and I didn't have the time to, to show you we look at the uh, uh, issues of, of inequality of opportunity uh, 
and, and whether, uh, whether this has evolved. And um, what we find is that indeed the, the education policy, for example, which is one way of pre-distribute, uh, having, having a more, uh, more democratic, uh, universal access to education has worked. We find that uh, there is less um, influence of your parents' education on, your, on the offspring education. So that, that has gone. We also, we also find that the skill premium has gone down. So in effect, even if there were some, some connection between uh, the education of your parents and the edu your, your own education because of the skill premium, it's, it's also gone. But what we found is that the, there, is still, there are still some influences from the, your parents to your position, to, to, to the offspring position, which we call the networking. So in effect, uh, it depends on which school you go, which uh, what your parents still have some, some, some influence. So there is, there is also some, some uh, possibility of doing something on, on that side. Um, on um, the second uh, topic on, on perception, well, the, the, the the, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to establish whether w w the a prima f uh, in, initially when you look at the, the demand for redistribution and perception of inequality, you immediately have a much stronger uh, um, correlations because both both variables are are subjective variables. So you you can it's difficult to establish exactly if there is not a third variable that uh, explain both. But um, but it's um, it's, it's, it's true that uh, we need to learn more of how these perceptions are formed, what people care about, and if we, if we are able to do so, then we will be able also to, uh, to ad address uh, better the, the, and, and design policies uh, that, that do the things that people want uh, more, more efficiently. Great, thank you so much. Jacob, floor is yours. All right, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out. And one measure of my thanks will be that I'll try to keep this brief so that, I, so that we can hear from you and not just from us. Um, but I also want to thank, um, I see Martine Durand and Jean-Paul Vitussi here. Uh, we earlier launched the, um, the, the new report uh, uh, on economic performance and social progress, and I was uh, privileged to be able to work on that um, and write about economic insecurity. And that's, to some extent, what I'll talk about today. Um, I have written a trilogy of books, with uh, two of them with a co-author, that will completely depress you. So I highly recommend that you not pick those up um, if you're feeling down. But um, but I do want to say that that. Uh, the one of these books, Winner Take All Politics, has actually been translated into Korean. So, um, so if you're not taking a flight home because you live here, um, then you might brave Winner Take All Politics. And that's actually the book in which I, my co-author and I really discuss the role of pre-distribution, the way in which government policy shapes not just, um, that government doesn't just redistribute through taxes and benefits, but also shapes the market distribution of income through a range of policies. And what I want to talk about today um, is very closely related to um, that uh, argument about pre-distribution. In fact, I want to, I want to talk about three things. Um, one is what I've called the risk shift or the privatization of risk, the way in which key economic risks are now increasingly being borne by individuals uh, and their families uh, on their own rather than shared collectively through um, public and private institutions. And, um, and this is a key theme, of course, of, of, of the discussion of social contract. The second, um, the second thing I want to say is that this is very closely linked to rising inequality. I'll show you that in, in statistical terms, but I think it's very important to understand why, and I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. And third, um, I want to sort of push back against what I think is a common view, um, or at least was a common view, that putting more risk onto people will somehow encourage them um, to be more entrepreneurial, to be more forward-looking, to be more hardworking. That's true up to a point. And part of the, what we're discovering is that providing certain kinds of key risk protections in ways that extend beyond individuals, households, or individual workplaces is fundamental, um, not just to economic 
dynamism and growth, but also to uh, a political system and framework that will actually uh, keep encouraging that dynamism and growth uh, and is, uh, deserves the trust that's placed in it. Um, okay, so the, the report, the discussion of economic insecurity in the um, for Good Measure, the, the, the section of the report that discusses different areas of measurement, talks about the, 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 these three fundamental changes in societies and economies over the last generation. I'm just going to list them here. Basically, we know labor markets, families, and existing social protections, both public and private, have changed a lot over the last generation. And, um, They've changed in ways that have pushed in different directions, but on the whole, I think they have moved us more towards a, uh, a world in which uh, many economic risks are dealt with um, by households and workers uh, on their own. It, this has, of course, been most clear in the United States, which is where I've done most of my research. Um, the, I was one of the first people to look at something called family income volatility, um, looking at the income drops that families were experiencing, and I was shocked by what I found. So if you use the panel study of income dynamics, which allows us to go back to the late 1960s and look at people's year-to-year -year changes in income, well, it's actually year to two years later because they switched to a biennial survey, you see that the chance of having a 50% or greater drop, a drop of half or more of, of household income from one year to two years later, has risen from around 2% in the late 1960s to a peak of almost 10% um, during the uh, financial crisis. Now, we have looked at other countries. When I say we, I mean me and my uh, co-author, Philip Rehm, who've done a number of papers on this. And what you see is the United States is exceptional, but, um, but that economic insecurity is a fact of life in most advanced industrial democracies. Um, What's an interesting comparison here is to see that as you go forward in time and look, follow an individual, that over four years, there's a 44% chance uh, that that individual will experience a 25% or greater drop in their household income. And you can just compare here Great Britain uh, and Germany and Switzerland and see that you have to go follow someone for twice as many years to get the same expected probability of such a 25% or greater drop and uh, 10 years uh, in Switzerland and Germany. And indeed, um, within, uh, within essentially six years, the ha more than half of people that we follow in these surveys will experience a 25% or greater drop. And in two of these nations, Switzerland and Germany, we, at the end of the panel period, 15 years, we still haven't seen that proportion experience the drop. So this differs across countries. And it differs because of both the structures of the economy, pre-distribution, and, uh, and uh, as shaped by public policy and because of the role of public policies. And so the, po the policies um, do seem to be doing a lot, as uh, Mauricio said. In fact, um, when we look across uh, uh, roughly 30 rich democracies for which we have comparable panel data, um, well, it's about 24 rich democracies and about six countries that would like to be rich democracies. Um, but in any case, when we look across these countries, we find that the US is distinctive, but that there are other countries that have very high levels of instability of income, which of course is not the only measure of economic risk. Um, and, um, and that while we do not see a strong secular trend like we do, not do in the United States, that these countries uh, many of these countries do look as if, uh, at least as recently as the financial crisis, they're moving towards a more um, e economically risky world. Now, I should note that whereas in the United States we can compare the 1960s and 70s to the 1990s and 2000s, in most countries we only have panel data that goes back to about the beginning of the 2000s, which is very recent uh, if you think about the transformation of our economy from a manufacturing to a knowledge economy. Uh, and it's just not a surprise that there are countries that look, uh, that get to US levels of income loss very quickly during the financial crisis. The two most obvious examples are Spain and Greece, though the figures look pretty similar, uh, alas, for Italy. Um, so these are countries in which, as you can see, in Greece, almost 40% uh, of the population was experiencing uh, year over year, 25% or greater income drop during the financial crisis. Okay, how is this linked to inequality, my second point? Well, 
First thing to say is that the U.S. stands out on both these dimensions. And, um, and I, I just want to show you a figure that I'm sure many of you have seen, but I think it drives home the extent to which the U.S. is distinctive. So in the U.S., the top 1 percent and the bottom 50 percent of the population have basically switched places, right? The share of income going to the top 1 percent has risen from uh, run rough, roughly 10 percent to almost uh, t to over 20 percent. The share of, of income going to the bottom half of the population has fallen from around 20 to 21 percent down to less than um, 14 percent. And that's just not so much the case in, in Europe it, if we look at it as a whole. Um, there are definitely countries in which similar trends have occurred, although they're not as intense. The, the UK being the main one. And I think this matters because, I mean, it suggests that if those levels of inequality do uh, begin to manifest, as many fear, that we're going to also see rises in the kind of insecurity we're talking about. Because if you think about it, the most fundamental form of insecurity, the one that really leads to the most uh, of the backlash against governments, has to do with failure to be able to um, achieve a middle class life. And what we're finding is that. It, as societies become more stratified, right, the income and risk are also necess are almost necessarily becoming more tightly linked. One of the things we've looked at is this question of, well, if income and the chance of experiencing, say, unemployment and income are very closely related, that tends to undermine support for solutions, just as was suggested. Um, and, we've d and I've done a number of studies on this, but I'll just show you one finding, right? When income and risk, unemployment risk in this case are very correlated. So when you have a low income, you have a much greater chance of being unemployed. You have m much lower average levels of support for unemployment benefits. So here you see the link between inequality and unemployment. It breaks the bonds of solidarity that bring people together in support of shared social protections. But as I said, the most fundamental risk that's linked to rising inequality is this risk of not uh, I've done this for the U.S., don't bother, ignore that slide. The most fundamental risk is this risk of failing to achieve a middle class life. And I think many of you are probably familiar with the work that Raj Chetty has done on this. And what Chetty has found essentially is that people who um, are growing up in the current era have a much, much greater chance of failing to achieve um, the kind of uh, income that their parents did. So this is absolute income mobility. And what's most interesting, so here are people born in the 1940, there's basically a 90% chance. People born in the 1980s, there's basically a 50% chance, a coin flip. But what's interesting is Chetty shows that this isn't because of growth. If we had the same level of growth after 1980 as we did before 1980, we would only see a small increase in the share of people who are achieving higher incomes than their parents. However, if inequality had been held steady, we would have seen very little decline in the chance of upward mobility. So this is, again, to show you inequality is linked not just to immediate risks, but to fundamental risks about life chances. And indeed, I think if you look at countries, the degree to which they reduce inequality, um, it's very closely related to the degree to which they reduce risk, which we're, we measure here similarly to Gini reduction that was mentioned. We look at the, cha the degree to which government taxes and transfers prevent someone who would have experienced a 25 percent or greater income drop from experiencing it. So I have already gone over my time, and I'll just close with these reflections. So first, as I said at the outset, we should see security as essential to opportunity, not just to the opportunity uh, to be able to live a meaningful life, but the opportunity to be able to rise uh, to a position that's comparable to our parents. Um, and we should understand that this is not an anti-capitalist notion. It's at the heart of capitalism, right? We used to have uh, a form of limited liability for both corporations and families, and now increasingly we have full liability for, for families and limited liability for those at the top. And then um, I do think that as we go forward, we're just going to see a lot more of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a crisis around these questions of uh, upward mobility and long-term opportunity because these skill investments that we're asking people to make in the knowledge economy are risky, right? They're tied to specific jobs and lines of occupations that digitalization and AI are going to put at risk. And so we can't expect people to take on more risk without also providing them with key forms of insurance. And if we don't, I'm fearful that we'll see something um, that is uh, not just individual hardship, but also political backlash. And Coming from the United States, I'll just say that um, it's not pretty. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. A um, couple of questions from my side. Um, so in your last slide, you highlighted that this is uh, really not anti-capitalistic type of agenda. Uh, and I, in your um, work with uh, Paul Pearson, American Amnesia, you actually has talked a lot and documented a lot about the work that uh, government actually did in the US. So the US uh, governments in the 20th century actually did a lot to enable innovation market dynamism and developed, I mean, supported the development of what you call a mixed economy. So my question is, how do you see the state recapturing this role? And it, it is related, that question is very much related to also uh, some of the um, material you presented at the very beginning on, on the notion of winner take all uh, sort of dynamics and sort of within politics, because we understand that obviously, uh, you know, there is a link to the uh, policy capture. So how do you actually break that uh, capture? Well, let me be very brief because I think David has a lot to say about this. I'll just um, briefly say that what we found in American Amnesia, a book that we wrote um, because we feel that the U.S.'s role in fostering um, shared prosperity in the 20th century is often uh, misunderstood and forgotten, what we found is really that the most fundamental uh, innovations uh, in American economic history um, were rooted in the state's role as a provider of education, improved health, um, and um, in incentives for uh, innovation, including massive research and development investments. And I do fear that we're losing, losing that, um, and you can see that every day in the discourse and debates in the United States. But I am, I, am, I must say, somewhat hopeful, and for two reasons. One is, um, the knowledge economy is is a case in is a world in which um, if you recognize these interdependencies and the role of public investment, you can reap really large rewards. So um, there's a tendency, I think, to see this as continually a kind of zero sum game in which uh, all the good fruit has been picked from the tree. Um, but if you look at broadly at well-being, advances in health, in education, uh, in shared prosperity, not just GDP, um, you see that there's actually a lot of money on the table and that smart public policies can achieve that. Um, I think the challenge is that no one, in, no one in rich societies in this era will accept a government that operates in the way that many successful governments operated in the mid 20th century, namely uh, the idea that government should be um, a kind of benevolent um, dictator guided occasionally by you know, electoral, uh, electoral <laughs> interventions. Um, we're gonna have to have a much more responsive form of governance if we're gonna achieve these kind of gains. But I think there is a good news story here. It's, um, it may be clouded by the realities of present challenges. And the good news, the good news story is that a lot of, these, um, a lot of these, these real serious issues that we face um, uh, are going to be, can be addressed through government. And, and Paul and I have a line in the book where we say that no one really pays attention to the enormous ways in which government has made our lives better uh, in the last hundred years, um, tell a journalist that you'd, that you'd like them to write a story that has headlined, things are getting better, slowly, because of government, and they'll be run, run from you fleeing. But that's actually a pretty good account of what successful government has looked like over the last hundred years. And if we can make things better slowly through government in the 21st century, I'm gonna be pretty happy. Thank you. David? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's just a huge pleasure to be here. It's my first time in, uh, in Korea. Um, I raved uh, late last night. I actually woke up in the middle of the night and made the mistake of looking at this popular science article on the body clock and it's about 3.15 where I've come from. I came from the UK and it said uh, in this popular science, brain activity at the lowest ebb. And then for four o'clock it said, blood pressure dips to the lowest point risk of death now at maximum. So um, the omens aren't good, but I'm gonna try and uh, give you a sense of the work that we're doing at, uh, at uh, the Central International um, Cooperation. Um, 
I, um, I'm a senior fellow there, and we help run a multi-stakeholder partnership called the Pathfinders for Peaceful, um, Just, and Inclusive um, Societies. Um, the Pathfinders is uh, a group of countries, um, of international organizations, of global partnerships, of civil society networks that have come together around the sustainable development goals, and specifically the targets for building more peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. And at the uh, General Assembly in 2017, we published the roadmap on peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. I have a few copies with me if you're interested. Um, but the roadmap was a first attempt to try and sketch out how to implement this blueprint for, for humanity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pathfinders and situate this work, work in how we see the international system at the moment, how we see the challenges of government, and what that tells us about rethinking the state in the 21st, uh, in the 21st uh, century. So uh, roughly 10 years ago, um, well, about 10 years ago, just as the financial crisis was uh, hitting, uh, Brookings, some colleagues uh, um, and I, we wrote this paper called The Long Crisis of Globalization. Um, and this is basically how we saw the world in the long crisis of globalization. Chaotic, dangerous, difficult, many interlocking, um, interlocking crisis. And this is how we saw the, uh, the state beleaguered, um, facing a level of complexity and challenge that it was really quite ill-positioned to, um, to handle. And this is how we saw the international system, uh, a tiny lifeboat, um, struggling to, to, to help out. So a very, a very difficult and challenged, uh, challenging world. And I think what we've seen over the past decade is we've seen what was a, in 2008 a crisis that was primarily coming from the top down, so the failures of the state beginning to impact on society, is now coming from the bottom up. People have noticed that their governments don't know what to do. They've noticed that, they, that their, the markets are not delivering the outcomes that they want, as Sir Jacob um, has just uh, has just outlined, and we're therefore seeing this uh, this loss of trust, uh, this crisis of uh, populism in our societies. So we have a paradox, precisely at the set at the time when we have these interrelated interrelated challenges that desperately need a very high level of collective action. We're seeing the political roots of that um, of that collaboration of that collective action being undermined by our failure to deal with with crisis. And I think that's that's really what we mean by the long crisis of globalization. And our challenge is to try and find a way of responding uh, responding to that. I think this is a political challenge. It's not a technical challenge. It's a political challenge, and it's really uh, seen in three dimensions of questions for our institutions. First of all. Are they able to reorganize while undergoing change? So i.e. in that chaotic sea, are they able to change and do things differently? And that is the definition of resilience, and we're really having to look for a new type of resilience in our institutions. Second, can they solve problems at a rate that justifies their existence? Um, there's an anthropologist called Joseph Tainter, and he argues that as, uh, as societies become more complex, then institutions become more complex to try and solve increasingly complex problems. And the, basically the tipping point is, as you become more complex, do you solve more problems or do you solve fewer problems? So that's the challenge of institutional sustainability. And then, thir oh, wrong, sorry, gone the wrong way. Um, and then thirdly, um, are we going to invest in institutions and in collective action, or are we going to undermine them through folly, ignorance, and neglect? So in other words, are we going to do stupid things, or are we going to make sensible long-term investments? And that's a question of our collective political, political vision. Now, when we look at the world, we see many of the trends are adverse. We see uh, rising, as I said, uh, institu institutions under threat. We see rising levels of uh, populism. We see a retreat from democracy in many countries that seems to be intensifying. So the question then is, where do we look for a collective vision? And the Pathfinder is an attempt to use the 2030 agenda to look for that collective vision in the sustainable development goals. The sustainable de development goals say that we're going to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies where people can live free from fear and violence. And it sets out a number of targets that we call the SDG 16 plus targets. So targets that are in SDG 16, the 16th goal around peace, justice, and inclusion, but also all the targets that we find across the rest of the agenda. And I'm just going to show you some of those, um, some of those targets, the ones that we've picked out for inclusive societies. So we have targets for peaceful societies, so targets for just societies, and targets for inclusive societies. And what we see in this wheel here is a marrying together of our targets for governance 
So effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels, SDG 16.6, and a whole series of related targets that you see around that, um, that right-hand side for various institutions and policies and governance-related targets in other goals. And then around the left-hand side, targets for social, economic, and political inclusion. So this ties together, I think, the central message and the central challenge of our session is how do we build governance systems that work for people and solve contemporary problems, and how do we do that in a way that builds political, social, and economic inclusion at a time of rising, rising populism. The roadmap then proposes three transformative strategies to try and address these challenges, not just the challenge of inclusion, but the challenge of peace and justice as well. First of all, the switch from a response um, uh, mode towards a uh, prevention mode. Uh, I worked on the um, Pathways for Peace report, the UN World Bank um, study on prevention, and we had a box in that report that survived about 14 drafts and then was killed in the very final edition by, the, um, by, Jim, Kim's, um, uh, by um, um, Jim Kim's office. And it basically said that we live in a Tetris world. We live in a world that is like the computer game of Tetris, and our institutions are addicted to crisis. And our leaders actually quite enjoy crisis. You can have your picture taken at a crisis. You can be seen to be very dynamic, reacting to a crisis. But the responses that we need are much more like the game of snakes and ladders, or ladders and shoots in, in the US, which is an ancient uh, Indian game, goes back to prehistoric times, and is about that very, just as Jacob said, that very patient accumulation of gains and the avoidance of snakes and crisis that, that, can re, re, um, that can lose those gains over time. So this is an institutional and cultural challenge, how we rewire institutions that have become addicted to, a, a, um, to constant crisis and turn them into ones that can deal with prevention. Second, we have the institutional renewal that we need to de deliver contemporary challenges. And third, the challenge of inclusion, so how we include and empower people um, so that they can build a better future. So those are the three strategies in the, in the roadmap. We're now taking forward that work um, through a series of uh, grand challenges, one on justice, one on SDG 16.1 that says we're going to significantly reduce all forms of violence everywhere, and one on the links between exclusion in SDG 16 and inequality in SDG, SDG 10. And this is work that we're taking forward with the World Bank, with the OECD, with many other um, partners. And we have a coalition of countries come together at ministerial level that are beginning to guide that work forward. So the trick is really not to focus just on the how, on the, on the what, on the policies that we want to implement, but on the how, how we can build political support between countries, between governments and other actors in order to implement new, new realities. Ministers met a, a couple of times. They met during the uh, high-level political forum in July um, of, uh, of this year, also during the General Assembly. And in set, October, we had a retreat that was beginning to design um, this work. I'm not going to take you through this in detail because I think I'm already running out of time, but just to indicate some of the areas where we're exploring for these uh, politically feasible solutions. First, looking at the, um, the question of work, um, how governments can support uh, workers in a rapidly changing workplace, looking at transitional to su support to citizens and workers in volatile economic situations, also to shared capital and alternate, alternative ownership models. Second, we're beginning to explore how governments and civil society can work together to, um, to respond to political polarization and looking not just at the hardware, the, the, the hard issues that are driving that polarization, such as migration or inequality, but at the software, the shared values, the collective narratives, um, the trauma and threat perceptions, the narrative of uh, the shared experiences that we need to begin to understand if we're to move beyond a very divided society. Third, we're looking at innovation uh, in a variety of areas, but particularly at the moment in the field of justice. Um, so we have, um, uh, we have new data suggesting there are roughly uh, 3.1 billion people each year who have an unmet legal need, an unmet justice, um, justice need. Uh, many of those needs are happening because they're not able, these people are not able to form good agreements. Um, so how do we use technology in order to allow people to 
um, form the kinds of agreements that do not generate disputes that need, um, that need settlement. This used to be the business of lawyers, or is the business of lawyers and the courts, but for around 90, to in most countries, around 90% of, uh, uh, for 90% of people, those solutions are simply financially unaffordable. So how do we begin to use technology to support better agreements? And fourth, we're looking at the role of monopolies and market power in entrenching uh, inequality and in preventing these innovative solutions from coming forward. So the use of copyright and patent law to entrench incumbent advantage in the digital economy, the role that property owners are playing in increasing spatial inequality, or the ability of lawyers to block innovation in the justice field, despite the fact they only have a 5 to 8% market share in most, most countries. So I'm, I'm probably over time, so let me close by uh, returning to the political nature of this, of this problem. We have to create fora where governments look at these targets, discuss solutions together, and begin to use the 2030 agenda as a shared strategic um, framework. And we have some quite big opportunities coming up um, this, this year. This year in, um, uh, uh, in July, we have the High Level Political Forum that for the first time will look at SDG 16 and SDG 10 and our progress on those goals. And governments are expected to come together at ministerial level to discuss the theme of empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality. In September, we have the first SDG summit. It's like the Olympics of the SDGs. Every four years, leaders come together to look at what has been achieved, but importantly, they're asked to mobilize further actions to accelerate implementation. For, so for those of us working on these areas of tackling exclusion, tackling inequality, I think that is the time when we need to be putting solutions on the table so that governments can come together around actions, around solutions rather than problems where we can demonstrate a clear acceleration, so an increase in ambition in the second four years of the 2030 agenda, and that that's part of a bigger mobilization, that governments, private sector, civil society are coming together to, to push these new, um, these new agendas forward. So it's just the beginning. I think we're beginning to see governments taking this seriously, but in a very adverse political climate. That, 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 that roiling ocean that I showed you at the beginning, that is not a myth, that is the world that um, governments live in. But I think we can begin to build a strategic, um, uh, a strategic framework for, for governments. We can begin to show that implementation is possible. We can begin to show that these new models deliver measurable change, and then we can build momentum and scale up in the 2030s. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that you stressed so much the importance of the how, so uh, how we can make this you know, politically feasible. And yet, um, I find that the approach of you know, creating fora to address those issues is an interesting one, certainly from you know, an international and global governance perspective, but maybe it comes with some complications when you're thinking about this agenda in terms of national sort of political feasibility. Uh, so I'm tempted actually to put, um, you know, um, um, here, uh, let's say, some, some um, tweets that came uh, just, you know, in the news a couple of days ago, and Monica, uh, um, Deputy Director of Social Affairs at OECD, pointed uh, to me those tweets, which were saying that uh, there is an, a, an asymmetry between what uh, sort of the uh, elites care about and they worry about the hand of the word, and the citizens, you know, struggle just with uh, getting to the end of the month. And I think when I hear you talking about the importance of creating a strategic framework for addressing some of those challenges, I couldn't agree more that obviously we do need that sort of long-term perspective. But we also know that policy decisions, uh, you know, very often are, you know, very much uh, driven by, you know, the policy cycles. And those policy cycles are shaped also by, by citizens' consent that very often, uh, you know, don't go, you know, to that long term. So how do we kind of balance those sort of, uh, I don't want to say contradictions, but let's say sort of uh, maybe contrasting sort of challenges? Yeah. I mean, nothing happens in the long term. Um, I mean, we have to have a longer term vision, we have to have a longer term sense of direction, but governments have to deliver results within political cycles, and if we're, if we're not looking to do that, I think we're, we're just simply kidding ourselves. I think in the work that we're doing, 
it's it's enormous. It, it's striking how seldom governments really understand what what public concerns are. Um, we we work across uh, violence, so um, SDG 16.1 around violence across justice, and then the issues of governance and and inclusion. And in each of those areas, um, it, it's it's rem particularly in uh, uh, um, outside uh, a very few countries in Europe. It's remarkable how little data there is on public perceptions, how little understanding there is of the day-to-day -day experience of injustice of institutional, institutional failure. So I think the first um, priority is for governments to start being interested in that and asking some serious, serious questions, um, questions about that. The lived experience of, um, of exclusion, the lived experience of, of injustice. And then I think you can begin to design policies that do deliver something in one, two, three, four years. That that are part that then add up to a uh, to a longer term longer term vision. Back to my snakes and ladders um, analogy, and I'm not sure how well this uh, works for different cultures, but that is a game where you just have to slowly inch your way up up the board. And there are a couple of shortcuts in the ladders, but basically it is that hard slog of um, slog of progress, and we need to begin to build um, uh, the confidence in governments to 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 take that slog over, over a period of, um, period of time. All right. Um, towards the end of your presentation, David, you also mentioned some uh, you know, new uh, forms, actually, of delivering uh, public services. That is also an interesting way, I think, of uh, looking at the issue of to what extent uh, policy making and you know, the design of policies can be actually done in an inclusive manner. And I think this is going to be very much the topic of our uh, next presentation by uh, Che Gun. Good morning. Um, uh, could you raise your hand uh, uh, from Unpo? Okay, uh, more than 10. Um, my staff are here, more than 10. I'm contributing this session. Uh, you have uh, uh, learned a lot? Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Puslo, Mr. Hacker uh, discussed the social contract to address inequality. Uh, so uh, my presentation might be an answer to how to make it. Uh, today, uh, my uh, topic is participatory governance to empower the vulnerable in the era of digitalization. Uh, this is my uh, structure of presentation. Uh, first, I'll explain about the importance of inclusiveness in the era of digital transformation. Then, I'm going to elaborate on how participatory governance empowers the vulnerable groups. And then, I'll show how digitalization uh, can facilitate public participation. Uh, and then, I'll explain the challenge of digital divide, which should be set as a priority agenda of state. Uh, first of all, digital transformation may bring many opportunities while engendering the challenges of widening social inequality. This will leave further behind the vulnerable groups, uh, such as women, older persons, persons with disabilities, youth and refugees, migrants. In this regard, government has to address inclusiveness in the era of digital transformation. Achieving inclusiveness is aligned with the overarching principle of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which is leaving no one behind. To achieve inclusiveness, public participation is the most important factor uh, through which the vulnerable groups can be empowered and we can achieve well-being for all. This table is from the World Public Sector Report 2018 of United Nations. You can see the increasing level of public impact. By engaging the public, government can inform the citizens and consult and in, involve and collaborate with the public in the decision-making process. Ultimately, the public can be empowered by participating 
in the uh, final decision-making process. Uh, similarly, uh, this diagram from an OECD report also depicts different levels of stakeholder engagement. We can see that co-decision co co and co-production is the final process of engagement. This leads to balanced share of power among stakeholders. Public participation and engagement can create the balance of power between government and citizens. We all know that government is very powerful. It plays significant roles in budget, personnel, and law and regulations, empowering citizens, particularly the vulnerable groups, through participation and engagement can narrow down the gap of the power, uh, power between government and citizens. Public participation can also function as public control to enhance transparency and accountability of government. Uh, yes. Now I'd like to introduce several cases of participatory governance. Uh, first case is participatory budgeting. Many of you may already well, along, uh, well aware that more than 1,500 local governments are adopting this practice. Local residents can propose projects based on their real needs and vote to select the project. One good example is the process by New York City Council. New Yorkers, including the vulnerable, can make proposals on this online map and, and they participate in voting process. However, one limitation of participatory budgeting cannot guarantee the citizen participation in the whole process, like uh, policy form uh, formulation, designing, implement implementation, and evaluation. In this regard, uh, I want to introduce the Civic Participatory uh, Service Design Team of South Korea. At both national and local level, uh, citizens actively participate in the process of designing the policies and interact with the government. Throughout the participatory process, uh, citizens can proactively provide inputs pertaining to their demands and opinions. Uh, through this, the limitation of the participatory budgeting can be overcome by engaging the public in the whole process of policy making and implementation. Uh, let me give you uh, one example. A school for the elder women is one successful case from the civic participatory service design team, uh, particularly uh, in light of empowering participants. Elderly women actively participate in the process of program planning and management implementation. They are not just to receive evaluation and training. Instead, they proactively contribute to the local society by sharing the result of their learning and experiences. Uh, they, pro uh, they perform uh, as uh, so, uh, so, uh, story teachers at the kindergarten or participate in local environment campaign. During this process, their passive role as a welfare recipient uh, can be transformed into community leaders. Now, I'd like to highlight the important role to digitalization in facilitating public participation. Leveraging innovation and digitalization makes public participation easier and faster. This furthermore enhances government transparency and accountability. This diagram uh, shows the structure that how digitalization results in inclusiveness or well-being for all through contribution to citizen engagement and public participation to building participatory governance, and to empowering the vulnerable. This leads to importance of e-participation. Uh, these are the specific features for e-participation as reviewed by the UN e-government 
survey, uh, 2018. E people of the South Korea is one prominent example of e participation. It is online portal system that integrate petition, proposal, and policy discussion on the services operated by about 900 public institutions at all levels. Although e-participation is a strong vehicle to increase participatory governance, digital divide is a common challenge faced by many governments, particularly the vulnerable groups such as the poorest all the persons, people in the rural areas do not have access to digital facilities and public services. So, in the process of digital transformation, the government should put digital divide as the priority agenda. As listed uh, by the UNE government survey 2018, there are a big variety of characteristics of digital divide. The contributing factors of digital divide may include education, affordability, gender, disability, location, age, migration, and so on. We have some good government initiatives to attack digital divide, but I'm, not, uh, I'm going to skip uh, this Korean case. Uh, the Bangladesh Access to Information Initiative is a good case in bridging digital divide. Keeping in mind that the rural people have to travel a long way to access government services, the government set more than 5,000 digital centers and district e-service centers. The initiative makes it possible to provide trainings, innovation fund, and digital financial services for minority groups. Uh, uh, finally, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation by sharing uh, several key messages. Uh, first, digitalization is redefining the role of state, uh, private sector, and citizens. Second, participatory governance is essential to empower the vulnerable groups and promote well-being for all. Third, digital transformation requires a comprehensive approach that aims at co-creating public value with citizens. First, government needs a new paradigm shift in strategic thinking, legislation, and regulation. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks a lot for sharing this, uh, I think, very concrete and tangible experiences of participatory governance. One immediate question I have is, um, to what extent we actually have evidence that shows that uh, this sort of approaches to governance work from a well-being perspective, meaning that they really uh, manage to and really have a strong input um, on, on sort of the perceptions of people to be, you know, uh, put in a position to contribute uh, to society at, at several levels. So in other words, the question is, uh, do we have enough information that tells us that you know, when the government is working and reaching out to individuals and, and uh, you know, serving individuals uh, in that way, this is actually generating higher, um, higher sense uh, of civic engagement and therefore higher sense of people's well-being? Okay, um, actually uh, we are uh, within the uh, governance systems. Uh, governance systems is a system uh, to make something happen. So uh, it's a kind of system, so it has the characteristic of systems. So system uh, has its own elements. So we call it governance actors and also a uh, governance system it has its own goals, and each element, each government actors, actor also has its own goals. So, uh, uh, let me think about uh, uh, digital governance systems. Then, uh, who are the governance actors? Who are the elements of the system? First government, private sectors, private camp companies, NGOs, citizens, the vulnerables, public institutions, 
there are many uh, governance actors. They, uh, the, uh, uh, among them, they uh, uh, interconnect uh, each other and also compete and cooperate. The digital governance system actually uh, has its own goal. Uh, the I think it's a well-being for all uh, by using a digital transformation. In order to uh, make this, government role is still important because government has, uh, as a as a governance actor in the system, uh, has uh, the power of making regulation and laws. So, uh, as already I uh, introduced the Korean the designing uh, team or uh, uh, public budgeting systems. So, those participatory uh, vehicle, uh, if government uh, uh, make it into law, make it as a regulation, uh, then uh, we can make our governance system uh, from authoritative governance system into uh, democratic and participatory uh, governance system. Also, NGO uh, should uh, uh, make uh, efforts to uh, argue and request consistently uh, uh, to the government uh, for the uh, for the vulnerable, for, for, uh, for the vulnerable. Also, the vulnerable uh, try to uh, proactively engage uh, the, all the governance actors' activities. Uh, through uh, this uh, proactive engagement, uh, each governance actors empower itself. And then the, we can uh, make some uh, power balance between the governance actors. So uh, I think uh, uh, government is still important. So uh, uh, the, some introduced cases, uh, uh, it's not just policy, uh, not only just policy, but also uh, making, as a, uh, making it into the regulation, then uh, our uh, governance future is bright, I think so. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think it was very interesting that you said that it is important that, you know, one of those, you know, maybe um, um, consequences of empowering citizens through this participatory approach is actually, you know, to allow government to empower itself and in, in that uh, very specific, I mean, uh, manner than to support and, and I, I think, uh, you know, sustain uh, the social contract. I think uh, we now uh, get to the point where we want to open the discussion, uh, you know, for a question from you. So please let us know if there are any questions you would like to put to our speakers. Maybe, yeah. Uh, Leo King from Arsprax here. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'd like to specify the moderator's pre previous question by pointing out the uh, divide between uh, lay people's perception and elitist perspective to make a more inclusive policy. Uh, we all agree that we have to make some inclusive policy and address the inequality. And we rather focus on long-term perspective, but uh, in case of Korea, for example, many people have very uh, short-term perspective because they have to make their own living very quickly. And they, they are faced with immediate risk and uh, fear. So uh, majority of people, in some cases, are c clearly against uh, some uh, real allocation, uh, redistribution, or some more welfare-oriented policies. How would you address uh, this kind of disparity between peoples, majority peoples, lay peoples, short-term perspective, and their immediate need and fear uh, 
against the rather elitist policy, talking about inclusiveness and uh, some long-term perspective. Sure. I think we're going to take a few questions and then we'll, we'll respond. Please. I really want to thank the, the panelists for very interesting and provocative ideas. I, I have a question regarding the possibility of having um, some kind of mitigation for the insecurity risk. I mean, that was part of, of the argument uh, of that both uh, Mauricio and Jacob uh, talk about, and I'm sure that some of the other panelists agree. Um, one, one of the principles of, of policy is that governments can actually are able to provide this, this objective, I mean. And I really have uh, serious doubts whether in this new era of, of, of connectedness, of globalization, uh, national governments are able to provide for uh, better economic security when uh, we may have uh, shifts in economic uh, positions where corporations can actually change location of production, when we can actually import some of the goods and services from other countries, where uh, there are different when we have migration. And, and so, so things are more complicated and, and of course, uh, Mauricio had to make some uh, very strong uh, simplifications in the assumptions to build these very nice models. Uh, but uh, we can may get some insights from, from these things. Thank you. Hi. Just an additional, a little bit following up on the last one. Um, the last financial crisis uh, was partly, uh, I think we all agree, the result of significant deregulation and state absence, perhaps we could call it that way. Now, 10 years later, um, a lot of people agree that we haven't learned a lot. But most seriously, very few are, seem to reflect on the fact that meanwhile, the economy is now the attention economy. Um, there are four to five digital platforms globally that are running the whole system and artificial intelligence and everything that goes with it, robotics and so on. So the future, not only of the economy but of society, will be through those platforms because the ICTs are the platforms through which everything will function. So where is the state today for the next major crisis, because the same dynamics has been replicated. There is no regulations of these platforms. So we are just sleepwalking into the next crisis, which is not going to be only financial. It's going to be basically global and societal or social, let alone the environment, which of course is not talked about, but it's our little background. Thanks. Yes, <clears throat> um, Jacob made a strong relationship between uh, protection and trust. And I agree uh, totally with that. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, uh, the critique that uh, the state now has no more of a mean to uh, implement social protection. <laughs> But then, if uh, uh, I the couple protection trust does not function, you would have protectionism. Because there are only two ways of protecting people, social protection or protectionism. And what we are uh, <laughs> uh, having today is more protectionism and social protection. I mean, in some part of the world, and the tendencies toward protectionism may well come from the lack of trust that the absence of protection have uh, uh, created. Oh, sorry, sorry. Francois, please, and then I think we, we're going to uh, go back to these speakers. Yes, thank you. <coughs> this is a, a remark on the, this uh, issue of uh, economic insecurity and uh, uh, mobility, income mobility. I think that uh, there was very much emphasis being put on uh, 
the role played by inequality and in particular by the increase in inequality. What really matters is more the increase than uh, the level of inequality from that point of view. But I think that we should not forget that the other component of the change in security is growth. And uh, if we are in uh, countries where the rate of growth is very low, and uh, in Europe there are several countries where the rate of growth of the purchasing power of uh, households is basically stagnating uh, over the last couple of years, then of course any shock uh, uh, at uh, the uh, local level or the national level will be transformed into uh, some uh, drop uh, in income. So security is both a combination, I mean the evolution is both uh, uh, an evolution of inequality and an evolution of uh, growth. And from that point of view, I think that there is an interesting uh, uh, difference between the US where the main point is in increasing inequality and Europe where the problem may be in uh, not enough uh, uh, fast growth. Okay. Thank you. Who wants to go first? This very interesting set of questions. <laughs> I would say at least um, four or five of those questions were directed at me, so I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad. Um, let me just say two, two uh, three quick things. Um, because I share some of the skepticism in, in your question, um, and trust me, uh, American commentators and policymakers often really share your skepticism. I can't help but, um, you know, you can't read the news or uh, go online without hearing about robots taking away our jobs, um, the degree to which globalization makes distinctive national responses impossible. And I would just add, if since we don't have enough to worry about already, um, that insurability of many risks is threatened by the by many of the transformations we've been talking about when you can wear a, a you know a trackable health monitor and your DNA evidence can become public knowledge um, you know it's very hard to think about how you can construct um, good uh, insurance markets to deal with many of the key risks since we'll know the veil of ignorance if you will be lifted however I do think it's really important to understand that this is one of those areas where governments have um, really powerful dist national governments, though I agree completely that there's going to be need for transnational um, action as well, that they have really distinctive tools um, to deal with uh, key risks. And um, I agree, I think this idea that one of the ways you deal with risks is try to regulate to prevent, say, systemic financial crises or, um, you know, disruptive platform uh, economies, it, that's absolutely true. But it's also the case that, that you know, knowledge economies, uh, just like industrial societies, are marked by broadly distributed risks that are probabilistic, not deterministic, and that s governments can pool those costs both across people and over time because they're sovereign entities in a way that almost no other institution can. And in the U.S. at least, we have so many inefficient and costly forms of private risk pooling, um, particularly employment-based benefits, that it's not actually the case that we can't afford to better insure against some of these key risks. And I wouldn't say that we're doing a terrible job. In fact, that data I was showing suggests that a lot of the countries that do a pretty good job at reducing inequality, particularly the Nordic countries, do a pretty good job of insuring it against key risks. And I mean, this is not an original insight to say that the right approach is uh, almost certainly for, for growth is not to clamp down on the dynamism that produces growth, but to figure out ways to, let, to allow households and workers to deal with that dynamism through flexible tools uh, of risk sharing. And um, I'm challenged to think about the ways in which those can be governed more democratically. Um, it is ironic, I think, and, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, um, that some of the best solutions of the 20th century were not particularly democratic in the sense uh, that they were highly coercive. Social security in our country is a retirement program that basically forces you to save. And guess what? People love it. And so that's the last thing I would say is that I don't think that, the, I think the public short-term perspective is very much influenced by the ways in which 
this um, set of risk-sharing institutions structures their, um, their um, capacity to look ahead. And it's a great thing when a program can take uh, an, a, a key issue off the list of worries that people have um, and allow them to focus on the other things that are more important in their lives. And I actually think governments are often much more short-term oriented than citizens when it comes to these risks. Um, and so I will stop there because I've said too much already. <laughs> Can I sorry, uh, ask you to keep your remarks short because we're already running out of time? Thank yeah, you. sure. We're out of time, we're out of time yeah. Sorry. Well, I, I agree, actually, on that point. I think governments are incredibly short-term, and it's not as simple. You know, the public's a short-term, and the government thinks in long-term. Um, I also, to pick up on Romina's question from earlier, I think we have really good evidence from some countries that people care a lot about the fairness in the processes of their public services. They care about grievances, grievance mechanisms, they care about participation, and they're actually more influenced by that than the quality of the public service I itself. So the involvement in the process uh, is, is really very influential on, on, on people, and I think we've got good, certainly from the countries we covered in the Pathways for Peace report, we have very good evidence, uh, evidence um, on that. On the, on the question of the next global crisis, I mean, we don't have time to go into that in detail, but I think the thing that has happened is we've critically hollowed out our capacity to respond to that crisis. I mean, 2008 was very, very slow to get going, but once it did get going, it was surprisingly effective, at least in, in the short-term firefighting of the crisis, and the, none of that exists now. We're not gonna see a G20 summit suddenly happen to respond to the next global crisis as things currently stand, and that is an incredibly worrying position to be in, and it brings me back to this being essentially a political problem of us hollowing out the capacity for collective action. Okay, um, how to uh, uh, address uh, majorities uh, uh, taking uh, uh, take, taking all uh, systems? Uh, I think uh, uh, I want to focus on more uh, proactive role the civil societies. We have uh, a traditional system uh, by election, but uh, this kind of traditional uh, traditional uh, uh, election system uh, cannot uh, meet uh, uh, everyday lives uh, minorities. Uh, so uh, uh, let me give you one example. Uh, when I was uh, in the government side, uh, I uh, deregulated uh, a decision-making process uh, from central government to the local government. At that time, we expected, oh, local area, uh, there are many uh, civil uh, societies, uh, non-government uh, non uh, uh, non organizations, so even uh, uh, we are not, central government uh, does not uh, involve uh, this this making process, but the naturally the local areas, those uh, civil uh, societies, uh, civil society uh, regulated the local government. But actually, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, the Korea uh, uh, at 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 the time, the local areas uh, NGOs uh, was not strong, so. Uh, there are many uh, problems occurred. So uh, two uh, or three years uh, later, uh, those decision-making uh, power uh, returned to the central government. So now uh, it is uh, uh, go, uh, uh, goes to uh, back to the local government. Why? Now in Korea, in local areas, the NGOs are played very uh, strong role. So they can uh, regulate uh, the local government. So I think uh, mm, the important thing is uh, without uh, any argument or without uh, proactive engagement, without requesting, uh, the government usually uh, move slowly. So. Actually, the, the, it, in this governance system, move, 
many government actors compete. So important thing is each government actor uh, can uh, play a key role. Uh, so for this, the increase uh, their uh, power or their roles. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one thing to uh, focus. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll be very fast because we have. Uh, I'm separating you from from lunch, but okay. So I, I address uh, mainly the issue of insecurity uh, uh, within uh, within a context where markets, are, countries are much op more open, and the governments have much less. Uh, less power to, to, to deliver that. So uh, I, I have three, three suggestions. One is, uh, one is to basically to de-link uh, government protection from employment status. So the, 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 the welfare state in Europe, but also in the US, is, is based uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the idea that the, the majority of people had uh, uh, employee status. And so they receive their, uh, their health insurance and, and a lot of other benefits if they have that status. If they lose it or they never had it, they can't accumulate benefits. So they are, they are out of being covered. So the first uh, important thing is, is, is de-link uh, de this. It's not necessarily more expensive, by the way. The second one, uh, uh, which is more related to the fact that uh, of the footloose capital, you, you, the, the, the race to the bottom, et cetera, so it's, it's, it's fairly simple. There are issues of doing that, but it's fairly simple. Rather than taxing the uh, income generated by capital, it's taxing investors. Investors don't necessarily move. They, have, they, they, they put their capital uh, from one country to another country, but in the end, they, they, they leave where they want to leave, and you can reach them. There are drawbacks uh, to that, but it's, it's, it's possible to, to, uh, to do that. And, and by the way, that will take care also a little bit about the platform, because in the end, the platforms have ownership, and the ownership doesn't necessarily move uh, around to escape uh, the, 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 the tax, uh, the tax man. Um, so the, the last point I make is, is, uh, is a, quick, uh, a quick remark on, on, on uh, uh, Francois Bourguignon's point about uh, the difference between the US and, and the EU. Uh, which I agree with, but you have, uh, I think there is one element that you don't uh, consider, that is the risk aversion, that may, the inequality aversion, sorry. It may be very different in the US than, uh, in Europe than in the US. So even a smaller increase of inequality in Europe is much less tolerated uh, than, than, than in the US. But um, uh, there are many other things that we can maybe uh, talk over, over lunch. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, let me just thank uh, the speakers, but also those uh, from the floor who made very interesting contribution. This has been a very, very rich discussion. I think we don't have strong conclusions, but we are very committed at the OECD actually to follow up on this conversation. We'll keep you posted based on our future project on social contract. Thank you. <laughs>